Hello and welcome to this video podcast for evolution and diversity. This will be the first of a few video podcasts where we're going to talk about green algae and land plants. So today what I want to cover are these five different objectives. The first is we want to talk a little bit about why we should study plants. Why are they important? And then I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the evolution of multicellularity. We've already talked a little bit about this, but I want to go into a little bit more details about some of the mechanisms and some of the benefits of going with a multicellular organism versus a single celled organism. I then want to talk about the characterization of green algae and what led to the evolution of land plants. And that'll lead into a discussion of some of the advantages and limitations of plants as they moved from the sea to land. And then we'll end with some key adaptations of land plants. Okay, so let's begin with our first objective and get at the central question of why should we study plants? Why are they important? And as we get started with this, I wanna define a couple of terms for us. The first is ecosystem. Essentially an ecosystem includes all living components, which we call the biotic factors, plus all non-living components in an area. And we refer to these as abiotic factors. So the biotic factors include anything that's alive. It could be a bacterial species, an archaeal species. It could be one of many varieties of eukaryotic species. The abiotic factors, the non-living component of an ecosystem, these include things like the atmosphere, rain, sunlight, the soil, chemicals, and nutrients, as well as many other components that are not living. The next thing I wanna define is ecosystem services. So let's give a definition of ecosystem services. Let's start by saying that they are the many and varied benefits green algae and plants provide because they can enhance the ecosystem. And I think it's easier to understand ecosystem services if I provide a few examples of them. So I'm gonna give you four examples here. The first is that plants produce oxygen. And they do this through photosynthesis. And so this has a direct benefit to the ecosystem because it provides that oxygen that other living organisms can use. Another ecosystem service from plants is that plants build and hold soil together. So remember that decaying leaves and roots and trees provide food for bacteria, archaea, worms, fungi, and other organisms. Now together, this will provide organic material for the soil, and this will help build the characteristics of the soil and help enrich the soil. And ultimately, this will allow for that soil to hold nutrients. The third ecosystem service that I want to talk about is that plants hold water and moderate climate. So what do I mean by this? Well, remember that plants can store water and therefore they can act as a sponge. Plant leaves also play a role here, and that is that plant leaves protect to some extent the soil from rain. And as I say up here, they can moderate the climate. And there's a lot of ways they can do this, but certainly they serve as a shade, and that helps decrease the temperature. They can also block wind, and as such, they will decrease the impact that wind can have on local ecosystems. And the last thing is that plants are primary producers. 
And through photosynthesis, they convert sunlight energy into chemical energy. And also through photosynthesis, the point I want to make is that they produce sugars and other carbohydrates. The sugar that they produce helps support almost all other life in these terrestrial habitats. Also because of photosynthesis, they're taking in a lot of CO2 and converting it to sugar. So by the process of taking in CO2, they remove CO2 from the environment. CO2 being a greenhouse gas, this is a very important role that plants play in our ecosystems. And so when we have large areas that are now void of plant life and trees, that has a, a serious impact upon global climate change. Next I want to talk about why plants are important for humans. And I'm going to highlight again four things. The first one is that plants provide humans with food. I don't know if a lot of explanation needs to go into this, but certainly uh, we grow a lot of food that, that is uh, fed to our populations and so clearly plants are very important for humans because they provide us with food. They also play a role in providing us with fuel. And I don't mean fuel for our body so that we can function as, as human beings, but fuel to make life easier for us. So things like burning wood um, to generate energy, to generate heat, to do various things. In addition, we also use plants to make biofuels and biodiesel. In this process here, we can take agricultural products like corn and other products as well, and, and even waste products from agriculture, and use that to produce ethanol or to produce diesel, a bio form of diesel and a bio form of ethanol. But then these can be used to fuel vehicles. The third thing here is that plants provide humans with building material. So certainly we grow cotton, hemp, and other fibers that are used to make clothes, ropes, towels, and many other things. Woody plants provide as lumber to build houses and furniture. And the last thing I want to mention is that plants provide humans with medicine. It turns out that plants are a great source of medicine. Your book says that about 25% of U.S. prescriptions include one plant component. So why are plants really good at making medicine? Well, it turns out that these plants will produce chemicals and these chemicals are very effective at, at keeping animals from eating them. So things like morphine, cocaine, our good friend caffeine, all come from plants and they're toxic to herbivores. So anything that might eat a particular plant may produce a type of chemical that prevents animals from eating it. Over time, we have identified these chemicals and have come up with various clinical applications for them. I want to give you four examples of medicines that we use today that have come from plants. So codeine, as well as morphine that I mentioned up there, that is used for pain relief. And that comes from a plant. Digitalin. This is a very common heart medication, and that comes from a plant. Quinine. This is a malaria prevention. And the last one here is Taxol. This is found in only one particular tree, and so it has been the subject of a lot of attention at preserving this tree. But we've learned that this is a very effective cancer drug. Table 28.1 in your textbook lists several others. All right, now I want to talk a little bit more about multicellularity. And we've mentioned this before in a previous video podcast when we were talking about the rise of eukaryotes and introducing protists. But I want to go into a little bit more detail with 
with you right now regarding multicellularity. And remember, when we talked about before, I said it's one of the most major evolutionary transitions going from a single cell to a multicellular organism. It certainly didn't happen overnight, and it certainly didn't happen in a single generation. A lot of mutations had to accumulate within a population to allow for the formation of cells that could work together and then ultimately specialize. However, it has happened multiple times throughout evolution. And we're going to come back and talk about the process that might have taken, that might have occurred to go from a one cell to a multicellular organism. But what I want to begin with first are some advantages to being multicellular. One of the biggest advantages is that there could be cell specialization. This allowed the organism, the multicellular organism, to have a division of labor. Not every single cell in a multicellular organism does the same job. Many of those jobs can be delegated, so to speak, to specialized cells. Now, because they have this division of labor, the cells now are interdependent on each other. Since each cell cannot do the exact same job, they rely on other cells to do specific jobs. It allowed the organism to be larger, so it allowed for an increase in size. Multicellular organisms are more efficient in many things, but certainly more efficient at gathering resources. They are also they are also better able to adapt to a changing environment. So these are just some of the advantages. I want to come back here to point number two and discuss the size of the organism. So one could imagine that instead of having many cells making this one large multicellular organism, maybe you could just have one really large cell. One really large cell wouldn't give you that division of labor, but it could give you an increase in size. Let's give it a, a nucleus here. And you can imagine something of a similar size over here that is multicellular. And so you can see how these are roughly the same size. So why does this multicellular approach have an advantage over one really large cell? Now one of the reasons for this is that this multicellular approach, e even though it's roughly the same size, this is going to have an increased surface area. If you took the surface area of each one of these cells and added them together, it's going to be more than the surface area of this one large cell here. So this is going to have a decreased surface area. So why does this surface area matter? This increased surface area allows for more oxygen and more nutrients to enter the cell. So a larger cell is just not going to be as efficient at bringing in nutrients and oxygen and that's going to decrease its ability and that will make it overall less effective than a multicellular approach. Now let's talk a little bit more about this process of going from a one-celled organism to a multicellular organism. And remember we, we mentioned that in order to do so, certain mutations would have to accumulate. And so it would be easy to think that the chance of this happening would be remotely small. However, maybe it's not as difficult as we might think. Because we look, if we look at the evolution of life, we have evidence that, has, that this has occurred more than 20 different times throughout evolution. Even though we've seen this greater than 20 different times, the evolution of complex organisms has happened three times that we have evidence of. And these three times is what accounts for the fungi, which we'll talk about later, animals, and plants, which is the subject of today's podcast. This is a really good example of homoplasy.
All right, so let's now talk about these evolutionary steps towards multicellularity. All right, so there are many steps that we could talk about here, but I'm going to just break it down to a, a few steps. And I will begin by thinking about the step that had to have occurred going from one cell to having two cells that were together. Now this could have happened in a few different ways, but two different ways it could have happened is that you could have a situation, and this is the situation I've talked about before in a previous podcast, where usually a cell, right, it will divide into two cells and they will go on their separate ways. But something might have happened. And when they divided, instead of separating from each other, they came back together. They might have divided again, right? And because they now had this ability to stick together, every time they divided, the progeny would, of those cells would also stick together. And then this could, in this model, continue to grow and grow until you had a very large clump of cells. And we'll talk about this large clump of cells in a moment. And we call this model drawn here coming together because two cells come together. Now, another model is that instead of coming together, they just stayed together. That seems nice, doesn't it? And so you may have this cell, and instead of dividing apart, there's a mutation that would have kept them together. They still went through all the normal cell division steps, and so they would each still have a copy of the nucleus, but they did not finish this final step. And this final step is cytokinesis. And you'll learn about this in great gory detail when you take cell biology. So cytokinesis is just this last step where you pull the cells apart. And there could be a mutation that prevents cytokinesis from occurring. And the nice thing about this model here is we know there are mutations that prevent cytokinesis. So maybe it's easier to imagine how this could happen. Once you had these two cells, and in this case, remember, they're called staying together in this model. So once you had these two cells together, then you can imagine that they would continue to stick with each other because they would continue to have this failed cell separation, or this failure in cytokinesis. Now we know that something would have had to have happened at some point, another mutation perhaps, that allowed cytokinesis to occur again. Because we know now in multicellular organisms that while the cells work together, they are distinct. They are not connected to each other in, in a such a way where their cytoplasms would be shared. But regardless, if we're going to talk about the coming together or the staying together model, the end result is that you go from having a single cell to a situation where cells are together. Okay, let's talk about the second step here, and we're going to call this collective organization. And so you could imagine that you have this clump of cells here. Each of these cells are the same. They have the same function, they do the same job, but they are clustered together. You could also imagine another scenario where you might have another cluster of cells. We'll just draw it similarly like this. And in this example, let's just say they're the same species. And then you could also imagine a third scenario where you have a bunch of single cells unicellular organisms that aren't together. And let's think about which of these could be more advantageous at survival. That is, which one of these might have a selective advantage to survive and outcompete the others. So let's say this first group up here, they've gained mutations that allow them to work together to gather food, to move, maybe in some form of defense, maybe for reproductive purposes. But the key is that each one of these cells, they're working together in some sort of collective organization. A good example of this is when we talked about dictostilium in the last video podcast. And we talked about how these single cells would come together and form this slug. And this slug would move around looking for more nutrients or better nutrients so that it could survive. But that slug wasn't a multicellular organism. It was just a collection of a bunch of cells that were doing the same thing, moving and trying to find food. So let's say we have that one here. And then let's say this one here 
and let's draw a line between them so we don't get confused. And more importantly, I don't get confused. And let's say here, they don't work together. You know the type. They don't like to work together. They're stuck with each other, but they don't work together. They haven't acquired the mutations that allow them to work together. They saw the mutations that allow them to clump with each other, but these have gathered up here in green, have gained those mutations that have allowed them to work together at these and, and perhaps other functions. And down here, these single cells, they individually will do these same things. They will search for food, they'll move independently, they have some defense mechanisms that they can act on independently, they can reproduce independently, but they're all doing their own thing. So when we're looking at these three different scenarios, I think it becomes a little easier to understand why this top group here in green is the most fit. They have this whole collection of cells working together to find nutrients, to survive, to reproduce, and so there's a greater chance that they're going to be able to make new cells, to reproduce, to pass on these genes to the next generation. That is to pass on these genes that allow them to work together in these different mechanisms. Whereas here, they're not working together. They're not, they're not going to be able to do these things better, right? And individually, some of these are going to uh, do quite well, but not all of them, right? So this is just going to be a much better strategy for success. We just got done explaining how we have this colony of cells that are somehow working together. And that is why that this colony of, of cells is out competing other colonies of cells. But we know we're not done yet because we know that multicellular organisms like ourselves and other animals and plants and fungi don't exist just as this blob of cells, right? We, we, there's more structure to us. There's more, there's more overall form to us. So what's this next step? Well, this next step that we're going to talk about is something we're going to call the extracellular matrix. When you take cell biology, you'll spend a little bit more time talking about the extracellular matrix, but it's really important for us to talk about it here because it does help us understand how we did move towards multicellularity. So what is the extracellular matrix? Essentially what it is, is the non-cellular component present within tissues and organs. It is secreted by cells. It includes things that you're familiar with. Tendons are an example, cartilage, bone, the cuticle that we see in worms that protect the worm, the shells that we see in mollusks, and one last example would be cell walls of plants which is not the same as the cell wall we see in bacteria. It ultimately helps provide what you would recognize as bark on a tree. So the extracellular matrix is a very important component of multicellular organisms. But why is it important? And I'm going to continue that discussion up here just so I can keep it on the same whiteboard. So why is it important for multicellularity? So it provides structural support it's sort of the, the scaffolding that the cells can organize around. And so maybe that's a good way to say it. So let me write that down here. So it's much like you might see with the scaffolding of a building. If, if you've ever seen how a building goes up, usually there are a lot of iron beams and support structures that are first made. And then we start putting walls and sh other useful structures around these beams. But it's important to have these beams to hold up the building. In the same way, it's important to have this structural support to organize these cells. Another way we can think about this is that the extracellular matrix it allows organization in space. So we're not just a blob of cells here. This blob of cells is going to start secreting various kinds of extracellular matrix, and I'm just going to call this ECM. And it's going to provide the structural support for these cells to continue to grow and continue to differentiate. And I'm out of room here, but there's two words I want to throw in here 
and that's communication and protection. This extracellular matrix makes it easier for the surrounding cells to communicate with each other. And as you might imagine, when we talk about bones and the cuticles of worms and the shells of mollusks and the cell walls of plants, that plays a very important role in protecting the multicellular organism as it's. So with the extracellular matrix, this blob here now has a little bit more structure to it. And just to kind of symbolize that, I'm going to draw something around it like this something that's now beginning to hold them together. We don't really have to find what this is. I mean, it could be a cell wall, it could be a shell, it could be a lot of different things, but it's, it's providing a space for, for these cells to, to live and work within. Let's move on to this fourth step of the path towards multicellularity. So now let's talk about this fourth step that is going to allow a unicellular organism to ultimately achieve multicellularity. And this fourth step here is genetic coordination. So remember, what we have now is this collection of cells that are working together to achieve some sort of goal. Remember, we said what those goals were. It might be a goal of reproduction, moving, surviving some kind of stress, eating, right? a lot of different things this collection of cells is going to be able to do. And, and now, as we talked about with the third step, it has this extracellular matrix that is providing this structure for these cells to live within, to work within. And so now, what's going to be really important is that these cells now need to communicate with each other and coordinate with each other. How is it going to know to do these different functions here? One way it's going to do that is by having specific genes turn on or specific genes turn off. So what we're going to have to eventually see here is a degree of gene regulation. Turning certain genes on and turning certain genes off at specific times. Now, thinking about gene regulation is going to lead to our fifth step of achieving multicellularity. And that fifth step is cell specialization. Because remember, up until this point, we've talked about this collection of cells working together in some coordinated mechanism so that this group of cells can work together in the purpose of reproduction and moving and surviving stress and eating and many other different things. But what's going to be really important to finally achieve some level of multicellularity is that certain cells are going to have to be responsible for certain functions. So just very loosely thinking about it, maybe at some point these cells here, this collection of cells here, are going to take on the role of reproduction. Maybe these cells here are going to specialize and take on the role of movement. Maybe ultimately they become muscle cells. Maybe, just to carry this through here, this collection of cells is going to specialize in protection and surviving stresses. Maybe it, it leads to some sort of immune system. And might as well finish this off here. Maybe this group of cells here is going to be important in eating. They're going to develop specialization for digestion. And the, the way you get that, right, is through very specific and elaborate gene regulation mechanisms. Where these cells up here, they're only going to turn on genes necessary for reproduction all the other genes are going to be turned off. These cells here, they're going to turn on genes necessary for movement, and that's it. No other genes will be turned on. So now what's happening here is we're starting to get specific cells having certain functions, and of course then that's going to lead to specific tissues, and then that's going to ultimately lead to specific organs, and then organ systems. So you might develop certain tissues important for digestion, and that might ultimately lead to forming something like a mouth and a stomach and intestines, right? And then collectively, all of those organs I just said are gonna make up this organ system until ultimately you achieve a complex multicellular organism, right? And I'm gonna draw a stick figure here so it doesn't look very complex, of course, because you know my drawing skills are limited, but certainly if you think about a whole organism, such as a human, that has very specialized functions. That's because of everything that has led to this.
right? Single cells coming together, working together to, towards a common goal, and then developing this extracellular matrix so that there is a confined space where these cells are going to operate and continue to differentiate. And then there has to be this really well-established communication between the different cells that's going to involve this genetic coordination. And then ultimately we get this cell specialization that leads to these very specific tissues, organs, and organ systems until ultimately we get this multicellular organism. I should also indicate, as, as drawn here, I made it appear as if all the cells look the same, but obviously as, as they begin to specialize, they're not all going to look the same. They're going to take on different shapes, different um, forms, and overall structures. Okay, that's all I want to talk about right now in regards to the evolution of multicellular organisms. Let's go ahead and move on to our next learning objective. All right, let's move on to this next learning objective, and that is to describe some of the synapomorphies of green algae and plants. Another way to think about this is, what is the evidence that green algae were the ancestors of land plants? We can see in this phylogenetic tree that we have the green algae here and the land plants down here. And we can see that the common ancestor of all land plants and of all green algae is right here. So what are these synapomorphies that are going to be found in green algae and land plants? So what's going to unite these two groups? So let's go ahead and list these pieces of evidence right here. The first is that both green algae and land plants undergo photosynthesis. They also both contain the following pigments in their chloroplasts. Chlorophyll A and chlorophyll B. As well as beta carotene. Their chloroplast has a similar structure. In particular, thinking about something that we call the thylakoid membranes. The thylakoid membranes are just sacs of membranes found within the chloroplast themselves. Another piece of evidence is that the chloroplasts of both green algae and plants make starch, which is a large carbohydrate and a convenient place to store carbohydrates is building is to store them in these large starch structures. And the last piece of evidence I want to list here is DNA sequence data. In building the phylogenetic trees, we can see that the overall sequence of green algae and plants indicates that the green algae were indeed ancestors of plants. All right, let's go ahead and move on to this next learning objective for today's video. And in this one, we're going to talk about the advantages and challenges for plants moving from sea to land. So I want to begin by listing the advantages. The first advantage I want to talk about is that there is more sunlight available on land. If you think about the ocean here and then a land mass here and you can imagine green algae here living in the sea and then you see land plants growing on here. They might be simple land plants to begin with and eventually they might become much larger plants. And you can imagine that if we drew our good friend here, the sun, that anything above land is going to have easier access to the light energy from the sun. Now this light energy from the sun can reach these green algae in the sea, in the ocean, but a lot of that sunlight is going to be reflected off of the water. And then because of that, only some of the sunlight actually reaches the photosynthetic organisms in the sea. So by growing on land, you don't have this water barrier in between the cells and the sun. So more of that sun is available to these land plants. Another important advantage is the concentration 
of carbon dioxide is higher in air than in the sea. Carbon dioxide is essential and perhaps the most important chemical necessary for photosynthesis. And so an organism that can acquire more CO2 is going to have an advantage. Since there is more CO2 in the air than in the sea, land plants that have adapted to grow on land are going to have an advantage. The third advantage, the soil that the land plants are growing in is rich in minerals and they're going to be in a higher concentration in the soil near the plants. Whereas in the ocean, the very vast sea, these minerals are going to be much more diffuse. And the last advantage I want to talk about is that on the land, initially, there were few or no herbivores or pathogens. As land plants started to adapt for growth in a terrestrial environment, since they were the first ones there, there were no animals present that would eat them. There were also no pathogens. Now that would change over time, and then the plants would have to adapt to survive in the presence of their herbivores or pathogens. But initially, they were able to grow quickly and adapt to this land environment free of these herbivores or pathogens. So now I want to talk a little bit about some challenges. So challenges next. The first challenge that these land plants had to meet was drying out. Not being in a water environment, the cells on land were going to quickly dry out unless they could adapt to not dry out. And then a second challenge was gas exchange. How was it going to get CO2 in, from the environment into the cells? And now initially this might not have been a challenge, but as you'll see in a moment, the adaptation that helped them defeat the drying out problem led to a gas exchange problem. Another problem is too much sunlight damages the DNA. And when I say too much sunlight, I'm, I'm referring to the ultraviolet lights. While being on land did give those plants an added advantage because they had more access to the sunlight, but too much of it is a bad thing as it turns out. On land, there is no structural support for them. In water, they didn't need that structural support. And we'll explain why this was a, a big problem in just a moment. Another problem was a problem of obtaining water. No longer in a water environment, but the plant still needs water. And the last challenge here is transferring gametes. All right, I'm gonna leave this here, but I'm gonna change our objective because we're gonna use this information to think about and discuss our last objective. Okay, so this last objective is to think about the adaptations that unite the land plants and how these adaptations help overcome these different challenges. So the adaptation that prevented drying out was that the adaptation of a cuticle. And so I'm going to draw a plant cell here. And as it is, even with a cell wall around it, the water is not going to be able to, the water is going to quickly leave this cell, causing the cell to dry out. But a cuticle will form around these cells and it will prevent it from drying out. And so this cuticle is a waxy, watertight sealant. So this is really effective. In fact, a lot of people would argue that this was one of the most important, perhaps the most important adaptation that land plants had to develop in order to survive on land. So this challenge has now been met and overcome. However, that leads to a new challenge, and that is gas exchange. How is CO2 from the environment going to get inside of this cell with this watertight sealant, this cuticle around it? Well, let's just draw one side of this cell wall here with the cuticle on it. And as I said, CO2 cannot get through this very effectively. So to overcome this gas exchange problem, plants develop these pores, which are called stomata. Or singular, we would call each one of these a stoma. And having these 
pores now, the stomata, CO2 can now get inside. And that's great, right? Because now you can undergo photosynthesis. However, these stomata also allow water to leave. So now we're back at this problem here of drying out. So one additional adaptation are these cells that surround the stomata. And these cells are called guard cells. It's a really good name because that's what they do. They guard the opening of the stomata so that when appropriate, CO2 can come inside of the cell. But when the cell needs to preserve water, the guard cells will cause the stomata to close, preventing water from leaving and also preventing CO2 from coming in. So the guard cells turn out to be a very important adaptation, allowing the stomata to open and close at appropriate times to preserve water and also to bring in CO2. See, plants are incredibly clever and they do all of this without moving, right? Plants have had to come up with, the, with these adaptations we're talking about, largely in part because they cannot move. Okay, so now let's think about this third challenge and that is too much sunlight. So we have our good friend here again, the sun, and we have plants down here. And I'm just gonna make it a gigantic circle here because I wanna be able to show that within each of these plant cells, right, we have DNA. And while having great access to the sun is amazing and helpful for photosynthesis, and these plants benefit from that because they get more sun, too much of a good thing is often not a good thing. And so this sun, the UV light in it, will damage the DNA and it will cause mutations in the DNA. And when you take genetics, you'll learn a lot more about what mutations are, but also specifically what UV light does, the kind of mutations it causes. All right, I can't, I can't make you wait. I'm gonna tell you what it is, but it's not gonna be on any test found in Biology 111. But the kind of mutations it causes are called thymine dimers. It's the same kind of mutations that you or I might get if we were out in the sun too long without proper coverings. And so these thymine dimers can be quite devastating for these cells. In fact, if these mutations accumulate, these cells will die. As evidence of that, if you've ever had a sunburn and your skin starts peeling, the reason it's peeling is because of the accumulation of these thymine dimers that causes the cells to die. So the skin that you're peeling away, that's just dead skin cells dying be because the sun caused so much DNA damage in them that the cells were forced to die. All right, so this is a problem. How does this cell counteract that problem? So I'm gonna get rid of the mutations in here because these plant cells have a very special pigment in them called flavonoids. These flavonoids absorb the sunlight. They act as a sunscreen, so to speak. So the sunlight's coming in here. It's important for photosynthesis. The plant cells are extremely happy about that, yet, they don't want the DNA damage to happen. So these flavonoids have formed inside of the plant cells and they absorb excess sunlight, not all of the sunlight, but excess sunlight to protect the DNA from DNA damage. Again, plants are incredibly clever. So they have accepted this challenge and they have met it. All right, now let's think about this structural support problem. And we're gonna kind of tie that in with the fifth one of being able to obtain water. So now those plant ancestors that found their way to the land from the sea, as we talked about, had some problems. And a few of them I'm going to describe. And we think it's quite likely that the first plants that evolved on land were probably fairly small. And that's for two reasons. The first is that they had to be close to the wet soil. They had no other way to obtain that moisture, and so since they weren't in the water anymore, the soil here was moist and it allowed them to acquire that water from the soil. If they were to grow tall, and we'll just make this a weird looking tree here, there was no easy way to get water from here to up here. So they weren't able to initially grow tall like this. They needed to have some kind of adaptation to do this. So let's address this challenge first. How are they going to move water from the wet soil all the way to the top of a larger plant or a tree, for instance? And they were able to do that by having 
water, conducting cells, or in larger plants like trees, water conducting vascular tissue. So essentially tubes here that could run the length of the tree and into different parts of the plant that could carry water from the soil all the way up. Some smaller plants might just need water conducting cells. So this overcame this problem here of being able to obtain water. So take that world, the, the, the plants win again. However, we now have another very big problem. And it, it's a problem of density. Water is more dense than air. And so what does that mean? Well, if you were to try to have a plant or a tree grow super tall, or even relatively tall, and the water that was within this plant was filling it, and now this plant was full of water, and water being more dense than air, the tree will fall down. And that is not good. So there has to be a way for the plant to be able to take water from the soil and move it all the way up in the plant and, and have a, a much larger plant, a taller plant, without tree falling down. And it met this challenge by developing this complex polymer called lignin. Turns out lignin is very strong. It's a very durable polymer. But conveniently, it's also light. So these vascular tissues that we were talking about that transported water from the soil up a larger plant contain lignin in their cell walls. And so this same adaptation, having these vascular tissue moving water, allowing the plant to become taller, contained large amounts of lignin which gave it that structural support so that tree doesn't fall down. And that's a good thing. So you might wonder, why does the plant want to be taller? Again, we come back to taking advantage of the sun. Taller plants will have greater access to the sun. And not because they're like super close to the sun like I'm drawing here, right? They, they, relatively speaking, a tall tree um, isn't that much closer to the sun, but it, it, um, it does prevent smaller plants from getting the same amount of sunlight. So any plants down here below, say, a tall tree, has less access to the sun. So this plant is going to do better because of that. So once again, plants have looked at these challenges and laughed at them and came up with an adaptation to overcome these challenges. Now the last one here, transferring gametes. So let's talk about this last challenge, and that is the challenge of transferring gametes. In a water environment, the process of transferring gametes is, is simplified because of the water environment. But on land, it becomes much more difficult to get the gamete from one place to another. And the way the plants adapted to this challenge was by developing something called pollen. So pollen is a powdery substance that contains the male gamete. This pollen then can be used to fertilize an ovum, the egg. So being able to transfer the gamete is easy because of its size, it can transfer just by the wind blowing it to the female ovum. It can also be transferred by insects or other animals. So our last challenge for plants moving to land has also been taken care of by creative plants adapting to find ways to survive in this new environment. All right, that is all I have for today's video podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.